is the DeFi Decoded Podcast by Nine Point Partners. The ideas and opinions expressed in this podcast should not be taken as investment advice. Always consult with your financial advisor before investing. Hello, and welcome back to another episode of DeFi Decoded. I am Alex Tapscott. Andrew Young is off today. Um, I would say normally, Andrew, we talk a lot about XYZ, but instead I'll just talk to you, the audience. We do talk a lot about gaming on this show as one of those really interesting avenues that could help to onboard a lot of people into the world of Web3. In the past, we've had conversations with people who are investors in the space, uh, developers, and even people from the uh, the sort of wild world of, um, of Web3 gaming guilds. Um, and I think today's conversation is going to help to really sharpen our focus around uh, Web3 gaming, because the first iteration of games that came about in Web3, I think were predominantly focused on the trading and earning of digital assets, of tokens, and were highly sort of financialized. Now, they were extremely viral in driving people to, to use them initially, but lacked staying power because ultimately, you know, a game is only um, as useful as it, as it is fun, I guess, um, that you actually need to have something to keep you there after the rewards have become a little less lucrative than they have in the past. And that, fortunately, is the, uh, the central thesis of our next guest, uh, Justin Swart, who's a VC investor at Bitcraft Ventures. Bitcraft is one of the leading investors in gaming overall, and particularly in Web3 gaming, having raised uh, two funds that are focused exactly on this thesis. And they start with the premise that basically in order for Web3 games to succeed and to, to um, emerge or evolve as the next era of gaming, um, they need to be engaging fun experiences. And I think that's something that really resonates with, with a lot of people. Uh, Justin, we're really looking forward to this conversation. Thanks for joining us. Likewise, and good to be here. Yeah, terrific. So um, I gave a little bit of background on on uh, you and the group, but but why don't you just sort of take us back? So like Bitcraft is a, a VC firm. I think it has almost a billion dollars of assets through across yep. various funds. And the Web3 part of it is relatively new. So yep. the question is, where what was the moment that um, the, the organization sort of realized that uh, actually, that the Web three gaming space could be potentially the next frontier for the industry, and then similarly, how how did you arrive at a similar conclusion? Sure, sure. So to take it back um, to when Bitcraft started, this was some six seven years ago. It was before my time that I joined, but our founding partners and the team that was involved in starting Bitcraft are, I would say, the only way to describe them as OGs of the gaming space. Um, one of them, Jens, he uh, started one of the largest esports teams and leagues in the world that was recently sold to Savvy Gaming. Um, others worked across sort of very notable um, gaming franchises and studios across the world. Uh, for example, worked on the first Snake game, if you recall that, on those oh, old yeah. Nokia phones. So we're really at the genesis of, of gaming. I think I was, um, I was a champion in my high school at Snake at one point. <laughs> awesome. Um, and so I started with the thesis uh, originally that this was uh, yeah, at the advent of free-to-play gaming, games were starting to become much more investable and less hits-driven. And so you could make a, a VC case out of investing into studios building great games. And so about seven years later, we have uh, five funds under management of 800-odd million dollars under management spread across 130-odd portfolio companies. And... Two of those funds, as you rightly said, are invested or focused solely on the Web3 or the intersection of Web3 and gaming. And again, the first fund was before my time, but this was started almost at the advent of when Web3 Web gaming became a possibility, something to think about, a new sector that could be quite interesting. Um, and that fund was kind of rapidly raised uh, and invested in cross, uh, across a number of names that you you may know, and I think you may have had some guests on your show as well um, that we've invested in. And the reason why this is interesting and, and you know, the thesis behind why we've invested in the space and proverbially you know, put some chips on the table here, I would say is th there's various perspectives that we could take about why Web3 Gaming makes sense. So number one, the players you know, of which we are at Bitcraft, all gamers, and you know, we, we're sort of very passionate gamers across the whole host and, and a number of platforms. If you look at the player's perspective, the 
reason you may hear quite a lot um, lately, and I think you you may have touched on this in your in your book, Alex, is what does it mean to have true ownership of these digital assets? And I think this is something that resonates from an emotional perspective that I don't know if, if that's spoken about as much, but if you're a sort of you know, quite religious, uh, I would say gamer, or you game quite a bit, there's something that there's a story we love to tell about one of our portfolio companies, um, Jeff Butler from Avalon, um, building a great MMO in the space. Uh, he was at EverQuest, which was one of the largest MMOs uh, way back when. It was you know, one of the hallmark uh, games that were designed uh, back when MMOs were getting to sort of some sizable scale. For some of our non-gamer audience, MMO. Of course. <laughs> Sorry. Massively multiplayer online game. Yeah. Yeah, okay. um, it's just in, 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 think for, MMORPG, the RPG being role-playing game. Role-playing right? game, yes, yeah, yes. Yeah. And for, MMO, for those... I've never heard it shortened just to MMO before. Yes, sorry. I'm not, I'm not Forgive even... me, so please stop me when I when I um, get into <laughs> no, that's, silly that's acronym. Great. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah it, it, for people who just don't know what this is at all, it's just a whole host of players interacting in one kind of world, envi- virtual world, world environments at the same time, pretty much. Yeah, so um, let's talk a little bit. Oh, sorry. Did, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. I was just going to, the, the, he tells a lovely story about the mo- the emotional kind of resonance that he had when he was playing EverQuest, or I think it was World of Warcraft, sorry. And he spent a lot of time finding some rare sword, um, or some rare item that he walked through this world um, and he was invited by other players to just really showcase this kind of item that he had. And he said the feeling he got from that was, was incredibly special. Um, there's also other players that when he designed worlds in EverQuest, um, I think it was a paraplegic player who felt like he could fly when he was playing the game and he had a certain dragon that he bought, for example. And I think the emotional resonance of these items, particularly when you de- uh, dedicate a lot of your time and efforts into these worlds, particularly when you're spending a lot more time interacting with people across these worlds, um, becomes quite important. And when you tie that to actual ownership, um, it becomes pretty interesting. The other implications, which I'm sure you've spoken about and you have touched on a lot, is the financial implications of owning your own assets and being able to do with it what you will across these frictionless secondary markets. There's yeah. other there's other perspectives we can touch on, but I'll pause there and see if there's any tangents we can dive into. Well, this, there are lots of tangents that we can dive into. <laughs> I think, and I think that ownership... I mean, Web3 is the read, write, own web. And the idea that individuals can actually have ownership, pro- digital property rights in the true sense to financial assets, but in-game assets or other, you know, um, things of value is is clearly really revolutionary. Um, I, I want to just put a pause on that for a sec, just to go yeah. back and um, talk a little bit about the evolution of investment in gaming. So you mentioned that in the early days, sure. it was very hits driven. And I think, you know, until maybe 10 years ago, most people who are playing video games were playing video games on consoles or PCs. And there was sort of like discussion. I remember back then, um, because I used to work in the uh, investment banking and we we saw clients like this, about how Mm -hmm. uh, gaming is sort of saturated, like the number of people who will spend $600 on a box that they plug into their TV and play, you know, with a controller is going to be capped. So I don't know where it's capped, but it's probably capped at like, you know, a few hundred million people. And then what we saw was the rise of smartphones as a platform for gaming and not and not complex games like World of Warcraft or Halo or Metal Gear Solid or whatever, but like relatively simple, fun, easy games that anyone could play. And um, that led also to the creation of a new kind of business model, the free to play model. Where like in the console market, like you have to spend like hundreds of dollars just to get set up. But in the free to play model, it's free to play. But then yep. after the afterwards, there's all these ways that you can monetize, right? With in-game purchases and, and so on and so forth. And what was really interesting about uh, the free to play model for gaming was that it actually grew the market significantly. It grew the market in terms of new people who were playing just free to play games, but it actually grew the market for console games too. Like it, yeah. it made gaming more popular and that increased the, po- the size of the pie for everyone. And I think about, um, you mentioned, now that's a segue back into ownership. So with the question yeah. of ownership, you know, the question is, will ownership be that killer app that helps to grow the gaming market even more? Um, that will help to onboard new people and to also grow the market for gaming as a whole. 
And I think that's a really interesting concept to, to untangle and to talk a little bit about how ownership works inside, inside of some of these games. Now, like yeah. in the, in the, in the traditional sort of web two model, people are already spending billions of dollars on virtual assets and experiences that they buy, but they don't own right in the in a true sense of the word you know even something like roblox you know if you use robux you pay real fiat money to buy an in-game yep. mask or fortnite you buy a skin you may have made the purchase but you don't have property rights to them so like let's talk about property rights both in terms of their um how they enhance gameplay but also what they mean from a financial perspective and how they change maybe the economics of the of gaming overall and who gets to share yep. in the side right so let's yep. let's let's start on the on the first bit which is to me it makes intuitive sense if you're going to spend money on something you might as well own it but um not everybody sees it that way and and i'm curious like from your perspective how uh, ownership is how it flies with existing gamers and and existing game players and yep. by that industry players <laughs> Yeah, spot on. So you, you, your one question about, you know, is this the new thing? Is this the new um, paradigm, I guess, for, for gaming as a business model? Always, I think, if you're a, a curious investor is to look at the history um, of a certain field or, or sector and the history of gaming and how we got to the, these business models it goes way back um, to you know, the coin arcade uh, um, um, era where you would be pretty much playing in a sense, a microtransaction for some playtime. You'd be renting some time on a machine to play yeah. through a kind of a Pac-Man level. And then uh, platform uh, consoles and hardware devices came out so you could bring that experience into the home. And the way to monetize that was typically who owned the distribution and publishing agreements. It was big, well, big box retailers were the ones that were, I guess, the the um, had the, the sort of chokehold on the industry and dictated that the $60 um, game price would make sense to get your however many hours, 50 hours of gameplay um, so that you could sell all of that upfront uh, to users who had spent all this money on the console, as you say, um, and then sort of paying for a game for that X amount of playtime, 60 hours of playtime. And that model persisted for quite some time. Um, even as we moved to a more digitally native era where you could buy games and download them over the internet. Um, and this was through the advent of particularly the Steam store when it shipped with Half-Life um, as an updater just for the game. It suddenly became easier to reach users um, and allow them to download games over the internet. Now, as internet speeds improved, as hot computer hardware improved, it took a while for the, that adjustment to take place. You know, as as we tend to, as any new parata- paradigm tends to have, there's always some kind of skewmorphism um, uh, that takes place. You know, you sort of map what happened in history and you try to just smash it into this new kind of thing that you have. Yeah. And eventually, you know, so the, the industry cottoned on to um, a free-to-play model, which there's, I don't, I won't go into the kind of, there's, there's quite a deep history around, uh, around it. And with the podcast I recommend listening to is a podcast called Gamecraft. Um, highly recommended. Sort of goes through the history of um, video gaming, um, which yeah, I'm sure we could link in the notes or something. Yeah. And it, it's is that the Gamecraft's podcast? These are, this is a podcast from the Benchmark Capital uh, team. Okay. And they spent their, they, I think both had careers in the video gaming space and they sort of just talked through their experiences and how we got to where we are. It's a wonderful podcast and I highly recommend it. Um, and eventually uh, this idea of giving things out for free, uh, giving the uh, game access out for free, which was completely insane at the time um, because there was no idea of how you could monetize um, players, was sort of proposed and it took a while, but eventually saw quite a lot of success because what was happening at the at the time that that why this made success is that oh why this um, saw some success is that more people were coming online, bandwidth speeds were improving, hardware and especially home hardware um, performance uh, speeds were increasing, uh, and you had this huge liquidity of players that were not being efficiently included into games, particularly multiplayer games, and so the mm-hmm. idea was to open it up to players essentially increasing 
liquidity within games and liquidity just meaning you know the number of concurrent players within a game uh, instance or the number of monthly players within a game game instance instead of paying sixty dollars to to play a game you can now enter this game instance for free but the way to monetize was through status essentially so the players if you just look at a just typical distribution of who's paying for what in any kind of game it follows a Pareto um uh, Pareto uh, curve, right? So 20% of all players pretty much generate 80% of the revenues. Uh, and so in gaming, they're typically referred to as whales. And whales are the ones that are generating most of the revenue in games. And so the idea was to more effectively practice uh, price discrimination. We go back to kind of economics 101 and charge people what they're willing to pay, but more effectively target whales who are the guys uh, uh, generating most of the revenues yeah. and so the idea and the way to uh, monetize whales was typically because they've spent so much time and money in a game um, and invested so much of their I guess life playing this game is by offering them status objects like skins um, uh, moves dance emotes that you're seeing in things like Fortnite yeah. um, and this was just a way to allow those who are wanting to I guess, like as we all are status monkeys, um, just trying to show yeah. off in this kind of tribe that we have, uh, this just gives them a way and, and a more effective way to do that while increasing the number of players in this instance by allowing them access into the game world for free. So that's where we are today. Now, yes. n- next is ownership. And what does that uh, if, if essentially mean? And why we think it's uh, an interesting paradigm. When you have now this liquidity of players and you have these whales that you are targeting and and more efficiently monetizing your um, user base, giving people ownership effectively turns them into cheerleaders and and, um, salesmen and saleswomen for your game. And why is that interesting in today's game world? Well, you've seen the impact, or I I don't know if if it's sort of fully clear for your your audience, perhaps they know or don't know, but um, Apple being a sort of very dominant platform for, as you mentioned, mobile games has come down quite hard on privacy, um, instituted um, the IFDA uh, privacy rulings that allow that prevent you from efficiently targeting users. Uh, Facebook and the meta ecosystem has made it also much harder to target users alongside just a swath of capital um, coming to the space, funding a whole load of uh, gaming studios wanting to also build games. Which, meant, which means it's also become incredibly competitive because there's not just you know, a handful of games out there. There's many thousands of games competing for, I don't want to say a capped user base. Um, I, I mean, there's 3.6 billion gamers out there in the world, depending on how you define it, like about a billion PC gamers. So there's a huge user base, um, but it's not growing as fast as it used to be. And so what does that mean? It means it's just much harder to find users and much harder to get any game uh, into in front of users or on their uh, platform of choice. And so why is ownership so interesting? Well, if you suddenly give someone something for free or perhaps they buy it, whatever it may be, but they truly own that, we've seen metrics that it increases retention rates in games by just frankly kind of ridiculous figures that are at times hard to believe. Now, What's the that flip side of that... Justin, like uh, which titles in particular has that data been gathered from? So it, the, the comment is broadly across uh, all, gener- all genres that we've seen. Yeah. Um, so when you say ownership, they, you like web three games that, that enable ownership. Yes, uh, apologies. Yeah, yeah. That yeah. Drives, so we've seen, that's the thing that's driving engagement. Yeah. Yes, yes, apologies. So, so when we've, no, no, uh, we've, okay. we've, 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 seen, we've seen when users um, you know, have some ownership and are heavily invested in the game that they retain just at really incredible rates. Now, the flips out of that coin and speaking to the immaturity perhaps of the industry of where we're at uh, where we're at is when you have very clunky user onboarding experiences when nfts are difficult to use when you have to go off game into some sort of wallet then retention rates fall through the floor so yeah. it's this it's this bad it, it gives you this inkling of what's possible in the future but it also highlights you know where the pain points are for users at the uh, uh, at the time yeah <laughs> and and so in short it's I think, and we've seen this from publishers across the world. Um, spoke, there's there's some of the largest publishers in Korea that are rolling out Web3 um, gaming ecosystems. The publishers in Japan are extremely excited about um, 
what the the uh, crypto layer has to hold for gaming and it a lot of the discussions re- revolve around uh crypto as a distribution mechanism particularly because users are more engaged uh, given the assets that they own yeah so so fascinating a couple things i want to dig in on when when we made the leap from like con- from like arcade to console and PC, the market grew hugely, right? And yep. then when we made the leap from console and PC to uh, free to play and smartphones, that grew the market hugely as well. But to your point, you got 3.6 billion gamers. It's already half the world's population, right? So I wonder how much of the opportunity here is to be the thing that drives yet another way, like to get the last half of the planet playing video yep. games. And yep. how much of it is maybe actually m- enhancing the experience or targeting the existing gamers? Do you know what I mean? Because there isn't yep. like 10x, 20x opportunity anymore. And large, like due to the fact that the industry has been so successful in becoming like the dominant form of, of entertainment. And, and I just yep. find it, by the way, I find that so fascinating for so many reasons, because we spend a lot of time talking about, you know, TV and stars and movie stars and all the rest of it. But like, the gaming industry is on many orders of magnitude larger than Hollywood or or TV is. And I think it kind of weird. I don't know if it flies under the radar, but it doesn't, it doesn't, it's not talked about in the same way. So anyway, how do you think about that? Is this really to drive the next sort of growth or is this yeah. to make gaming better for everyone? Yeah, it's, um, yeah, there's super interesting stats around this. I mean, the, the gaming industry is, depending on who you ask or how you measure it, is about 250 to $350 billion a year. It's bigger than movies, streaming, music uh, combined. Yeah. And just like uh, in terms of media spend, it captures a large share. It's the only, med- it's the only media avenue or property that's expected to increase in spend um, in the next five years going forward. It monetizes at the highest rate per hour. Um, wow. It's just really, it's an incredible um, industry. And if you if you look at where the youth are spending their time, it really is the the the, the digital third place um, for the Gen uh, Z and Gen Alpha, I think, or the ones before. It's yep. where they're spending most of their time. You know, the the physical arcades don't really exist anymore, so the safer spaces are um, in these digital third places. But I could go, I could go on that for for some time. I think you. You raised quite an interesting question, like how does the pie grow and is it more just sort of increased monetization growing the pie or is it in, uh, bringing users um, into the fold? I think the interesting insights we saw was, you know, what Axie Infinity did. And, and I know it's, I guess, taboo to, in a way, in a sense, speak about uh, uh, that period uh, of Web3 gaming. But, you know, uh, traditional startups in, uh, in the world of, of, of tech uh, back in the, the heydays of the 2000s bubble also gave some insights about what was possible. Startups like Webvan, you know, I think eventually led to companies like Instacart. And, and of course, they're, yeah, they were very different comparisons. But I just like to look at Axie Infinity and in that it did actually bring about a million people um, into the Web3 space uh, alone. Now, yeah. the argument could be made that, well, these people were just really... Um, from developing countries and they were really looking to earn a buck uh, within this kind of economy that was really extractive more than anything, some may argue. But I think there's something there that Web3 does help facilitate um, this different straight strata of users within gaming. And those users, you could, there's more granular ways to do it, but roughly you have users that are uh, time rich, but cash poor, which I think we saw in the Philippines with, with Axie Infinity. And those users could be used to generate economic activity within a game economy. Um, ideally, a sustainably designed and fun game economy that um, you know, a- a- actually has, uh, that is, is pretty interesting to play. And those assets could be bought by the end user. The end user of those assets could be those users who are cash rich, but time poor. Yeah. And you see this in, in gaming uh, today. Uh, you, you monetize um, users who are just impatient, um, just kind of pay for power-ups and that. And I think there's, it, it, the, the, the beauty of, of, of Web3 and, and um, the economies that they build is that these can be really rich, really deep virtual economy economies that can f- facilitate this kind of value transfer, this kind of relationship. And to go back to your question, like, if you believe that this is true, what does that in what does that mean for the pie? Well, if you bring on users who can find ways to 
um, you know, th those cash poor users, you can find ways to generate economic value within a game economy that should bring on and onboard a whole host of new users, particularly those economies where data costs are coming down, uh, where data speeds are going up, the cost of phones going down. Let's take Africa and Sub-Saharan Africa, for example. Smartphone penetration has increased like 3% as a whole, you know, as a population of about 1.2 1, 1. billion people. Um, it's increasing 3% 3, 3 absolutely, but I think 12% uh, cumulative um, growth rate every year, which is insane. Uh, it's just because the cost of phones are coming down. There's new ways to finance these phones. Uh, what does it do for the pie in terms of monetizing users? I think if you're efficiently facilitating value transfer, that's a way to kind of grow the pie that we've seen happen across any kind of economy and a traditional uh, economy, these sort of things happen. So I'd be, I'm quite interested in, in, in the, you know, the, this, I don't want to run back the play to earn model, but there is something about creating deep and rich um, game economies that crypto helps facilitate that we're really excited about. I want to touch on a couple of things that you've said in the last little while. You know, we're talking about, I, even I think this conversation, my questions are in a way sort of skeuomorphic <laughs> in that it's, <laughs> yeah. the question is, okay, so how can Web3 gaming grow the web, grow the gaming pie and, and enhance gameplay for, you know, or the nature of gaming for existing gamers? And, you know, like the, the skeuomorphic, by the way, for people who are listening, and like, it's a horrible, clunky thing to say. But basically, the idea is that you know when the the design of the of the new uh, in many respects resembles the old, and some of the times that is intentional, um, and sometimes it's almost inadvertent or subconscious. So, like the intentional would be you know when Steve Jobs was designing icons for the iPhone, you know you've got a, yep. a letter for mail, and you've got a phone for phone, even though that's not the form factor for those things anymore. Um, the the unconscious <laughs> skeuomorphic is more like the web comes along. What can we put on the web? We can put newspapers and magazines and classified yep. encyclopedias because this is a broadcast medium for information, just like TV or radio or text or something. And so the some of the early applications of a new technology are very similar and almost in a way to the design parameters of the old technology. And so when it comes to gaming, like it's like, how, you know, it's like you can really own your skin in Fortnite or you can really, you know, you can go buy, use your Robux to buy Starbucks or something. And like, yep. those are all useful. Like, and I think that's where we're headed probably. But the future is, is also going to be much weirder than, than we can predict because that's the way that this stuff always goes. Now, earlier you said this concept of a third place. And I think this is a good time, just to, the last topic I'd like to discuss is this whole idea of how gaming intersects with the metaverse. And, you know, the third place, so you and I are like roughly the same age. Um, in the 90s, the third place was like a park, <laughs> movie theater, you know, yep. uh, arcades were, I think, a little earlier because by the time I was a kid, I had a place. Yep. But, um, you know, there was this place where kids would go. And the idea of a third place is like you got your house, that's place one. Yeah, your school, that's place two. Where do you where do you go elsewhere? Like where's the where's the friend place? Like where's where else can you yeah. spend time? And it just seems to me that for those Gen Z, Gen Alpha kids, Gen Zs are now young adults, but um the third place is increasingly online, right? And look, I spend like five hours a day on Twitter. So I guess my third place is online too. But I I, I think it's different still with kids, uh, with younger people. Yeah. And so the question is. Like, what is the intersection of gaming and ownership and, you know, all this stuff with the whole idea that the Internet itself is becoming a third place? And with the rise of extended reality, you know, virtual and augmented reality, it's becoming that much more immersive. And, you know, in many respects, it's going to it's evolving into sort of a new plane or new shared reality new shared reality for humanity so i don't want to get too like highfalutin but you know this is an inevitable kind of topic and i'd love to just get your take on it yeah um i mean i we have i don't know the data off the, off the back of my hand but I, I did touch on it earlier that there's just so much more time is being spent um in these digital third places there were places like fortnite and roadblox uh and minecraft where particularly younger generations are engaging with their, their peers, actually meeting more friends online uh, than they would in their physical spaces. And there's 
interesting things that are happening where these worlds that have been created and particularly the three I mentioned also have allowed for um, a really strong UGC uh, tooling. And so to define that, user-generated content yeah. tooling. And so what does that mean? It means just, you know, if you're in this game, we'll picture this sort of physical uh, render, sorry, this digital, digitally rendered place. These tools allow you to create structures, buildings, um, different game modes, puzzles, say a, a maze that someone can walk through um, or a, a sort of um, a racetrack that someone can, uh, you, you know, that you can build that your friends can race on. And they've allowed for this tooling uh, to to um, they've they've uh, given this tooling to the users who are already playing their games to now make those users particularly uh, uh, pretty much prosumers um, so they're producers and they're consumers of that that um, good that they or this world that they are residing in and what has that done is it's turned some um, younger users into I guess entrepreneurs in a sense where they're making a few thousands sometimes hundreds of thousands of dollars uh, in building these games because they're just selling access to these game worlds or these environments that they have built and again what does that do it it, it shows you a vision of the future where the way that you monetize your life you know perhaps happens exceedingly more online than it does in a physical world now, a physical world is it's just something innocuous. You know, it's a typical way you'd go to a manufacturing job and you would you know, build up your skills to manufacture a widget. That's happening sort of more and more online. Now, we could have a debate about whether you, you want your society to do this and whether that's sort of desirable for uh, a society. Uh, but I think that that's a sort of longer separate discussion. Uh, but we're just seeing this sort of data in particularly in Gen Z and Gen Alpha audiences um, where, they, where they're actively spending their time more and more. Uh, and that's online, particularly for going venues like uh, Netflix and other various streaming um, services. And part of the reason is they're interacting with their, their friends and there's a social element. Another part is just gaming uh, activate. I think there's studies. I forget the author. I think it's. Uh, it sounds like Jane Goodall, but not the chimp. It could be the chimp uh, chimpanzee lady. Uh, but it's 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 a professor who looked at um, flow state or how gamers enter their flow state versus I think other occupations and gaming just engages flow state sort of much much more effectively for much longer periods. I mean, and, and if you've played any kind of game, you know this, even chess, for example, uh, as a game, engages you more than a typical movie would uh, on Netflix. So it's a very kind of powerful medium um, that can be used, of course, for great things like education and, and making friends and, and friendships and entrepreneurship, but of course can be sometimes overly monetized, which you do also see. Well, that, I think therein lies the, the rub for Web3 Gaming which is how do you add an ownership as a feature of gameplay to expand what gaming sure. is and to improve how gaming works without compromising on all of the other parts of what makes a game great. Um, because sure. we've seen the, the challenge of Web3 gaming scaling quickly because there's a financial reward, but not sustaining itself because there's no follow on from that. And so I think that just because the first instantiation of something didn't work quite as well as you yeah. hope doesn't mean that it's not going to work. And, and my yeah. view is that this is 100% where we're going. Yeah. And I also think too, that the biggest reason in a way is this concept of the third place, that if you're going to be spending time online and, and um, the internet is going to become more immersive and is going to be a bigger share of our wallet and our culture and our interactions, then we need to be able to preserve and enforce a lot of the rights that we already have for in the real world, like the right to privacy or the right to have property rights or the freedom to transact, right? And I think those things don't currently exist in these closed environments. In other words, I think that it's essential, really, not just to the future of gaming, but almost the future of, of uh, the web and, and of humanity, not to sound too grandiose. Um, so I think that being in the gaming side of it is such a fascinating place because... Uh, it is the on-ramp to everything. And I think it's um, just so exciting. Justin, this has been a really great conversation. We really appreciate your uh, sharing your insights with us. Where can people follow you and the work that you're doing at Bitcraft? 
Yeah, just at bitcraft.vc. Um, you can find us on our website there. And then, of course, our Twitter account, also at bitcraft.vc. That's it for this week's episode of DeFi Decoded. We'd like to thank our guest, Justin Swart from Bitcraft Ventures again for joining us. We will see everybody next week. No rest for the wicked here at DeFi Decoded. We'll be recording over the holidays to make sure you have content on those long drives to and from family dinners and so forth. Uh, stay tuned for that. We've got an awesome guest. You'll definitely want to tune in next time. Take care. The information contained herein does not constitute an offer or solicitation by anyone in the United States or in any other jurisdiction in which such an offer or solicitation is not authorized or to any person to whom it is unlawful to make such an offer or solicitation. Prospective investors who are not residents in Canada should contact their financial advisor to determine whether securities of the funds may be lawfully sold in their jurisdiction. 